Hello, everyone, um, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for another behavioral science uh, meetup organized by DOCD. Uh, it's really a pleasure to uh, welcome you today, but also to introduce our two uh, guest speakers. Um, we have Professor Pam Hurd and Professor Don Moinan, authors of the book Administrative Burden Policymaking by Other Means. Uh, Pam and Don are, uh, well, very well known and public um, policy experts, and they're both professors at the University of Michigan. For uh, Pam, her research focuses on many different things, but especially on inequality and how this intersects with uh, health, aging, and policy. And Pam also works on bureaucratic obstacles or frictions uh, that people may encounter when trying to access government services or benefits. And she's especially interested in how these frictions or uh, administrative burden uh, are reinforced by inequality. For Don, well, he's also a professor uh, at the University of Michigan now, and his research seeks to improve how government uh, works by studying the administrative burdens that people encounter when they interact with government. He also co-directs the Better Government Lab, uh, which looks, among other things, uh, for technology and other types of intervention to help government improve access to the social safety net. He also is also the president of the Association of Public Policy and Management. Now, Pam and Don, they wrote uh, this great book, Administrative Burden Policymaking by Other Means. And this has received really good uh, coverage and several awards. And interestingly, this book and uh, your research, guys, really helped influence both state and federal uh, public policy, including some recent um, executive orders by the Biden Harris administration. Now for today's meeting, uh, Pam and Don will present the research uh, showing how these burdens can limit access to public services and reinforce existing patterns of inequality. Um, so following this presentation, we'll have time for Q&A. So I encourage you to well uh, ask your questions if you are in the room, but also feel free to put your questions in the chat. So we'll make sure to raise them during the, the Q&A session. So without further ado, Pam and Don, over to you for your presentation. Great, thank you so much for having us today. We're really happy to be here. Um, I'm gonna start out um, broadly here, what we're talking about um, is uh, fixing frictions and reducing burdens um, in citizen government interactions. Um, and I, one way to basically think about the kind of framework that I'm gonna present, the sort of administrative right, burden framework is it's a mechanism or, a, or, a, or an approach, I should say, into how you actually address frictions in government, um, as well as actually an approach to how we describe them in the first place. Um, but let me start here with an overview. <clears throat> um, so the outline of what we're gonna cover today, I'm gonna kind of cover the first half and then Don is gonna cover the second half. Um, so I'm gonna start by talking about what these, what are administrative burdens, kind of how we define them, how we think about this framework. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about some key lessons from existing research. Um, Don's then gonna talk about some of the specific efforts, at least in the US federal government to do this, um, as well as a couple of empirical analyses um, from uh, research that we're currently, that's some of which actually is currently underway. So when we say administrative burden, what do we mean by this? So broadly speaking, these are meant to capture kind of the experience of um, these kind of negative interactions that people have with government or these frictions, like how do people actually experience these things? Um, and when we developed this concept, we kind of thought about a way to structure this in terms of a series of costs that people experience um, when they're interacting with government. So these are learning, compliance, and psychological costs. The first set are these kind of learning costs. So these are the process of engaging um, in searches to collect information about public services um, and how they might be relevant to the in individual. So basically like, for example, um, if I'm experiencing food insecurity or I need access to health insurance, or if I need a driver's license, what do I need to do to kind of access those uh, services and benefits? And um, am I even eligible for them in the first place? It's a broad array. 
So this um, very difficult to read and confusing chart is actually a really good representation of if you're age 65 or older in the US um, and you're accessing our public health insurance program, Medicare. So in some ways, this is sort of funny because we think of as Medicare as kind of the US's version of a single payer system that the rest of the world has. But in practice, the way that the program has been designed and implemented, it's really difficult to navigate, especially on entry, because it's become a hybrid system of both public insurance and private insurance that's subsidized by the government. And so when you go into that system as an older adult, you have to, you have to kind of you face a huge array of different choices on entry into the system. And then every year you effectively kind of need to choose in what your healthcare insurance coverage is gonna look like in Medicare. And these choices are kind of impossible to make in a perfect way. And they have really significant consequences because they can both aff affect your actual access to healthcare as well as the kind of financial costs you have if you pick wrong. It's a good example of kind of learning. The second category are these compliance costs. And I think these are the things that people typically think about when they think about like, oh, you know, red tape or um, sludge or something like this. This is the thing that I think that most people actually think about. And these are the kind of costs of actually follow, following the rules and requirements. It's the paperwork. It's the time you spend waiting in line. It's the fees that you might have to pay. It's the finding and providing documentation to show that you're eligible. Um, so this is going to be relevant later. Don's going to talk about a project that we're working on, um, which is the Medicaid program in the U.S. So in the U.S., right, we do not have a single um, universal health insurance program. Instead, what we have is a hodgepodge of different public programs and effectively private health insurance. For people age under age 65, um, as well as for poor adults over age 65, the Medicaid program is the primary way that people are going to access um, health insurance coverage, effectively if you're low income. Um, just to give a sense of the scale, one in two children in the US will be on the Medicaid program during childhood at some point in their childhood. So it's a huge program. Um, and the example of compliance costs here is um, if you're on this program, every year that you're on it, you need to prove again that you're still eligible. So there's like a renewal process and it takes place typically every year. It depends on what state you live in. So this is a this is a program that is federally funded or at least partly federally funded, but different states actually administer the program. Um, and basically the gist of what this figure is showing is the degree to which that people end up getting kicked off the program because they fail to successfully navigate this renewal process. It's really complicated. It's really onerous for a lot of people. Um, and in practice, um, a huge chunk of people end up losing coverage for procedural reasons. Don's going to talk a little bit more about this specifically, but that's sort of the gist. Yeah, the paperwork, the documentation, all that stuff, a ton of people end up getting kicked off the program and then end up just having to re-enroll again in a month or two later. Those people call this churn, at least in U.S. economists refer to this as churn. <clears throat> the last category are psychological costs. And this is, I think, um, specific to our framework. I think this is the thing that um, I think was sort of an important addition conceptually in terms of thinking about burdens and these ne negative interactions with, with um, policies and programs. It's not that prior people hadn't thought about um, these burdens or red tape, um, but typically when people thought about sort of this element of it, the psychological cost, people mostly thought about this as stigma, right? So how do policies particularly targeted at low income individuals make people feel badly? You know, you're, you're made to feel like you're kind of um, I'm not good enough or something um, <clears throat> and treated poorly in public programs and then people have the sense of stigma. But I think what we want to kind of, kind of to broaden this out and think more broadly about the psychological costs, the kind of stress, uh, loss of autonomy, frustration, even fear that people can end up experiencing when they're navigating these public processes. And one of the reasons these psychological costs I think are especially important is in terms of ultimately the level of trust that people have in government um, when they experience these negative interactions and the specific implications psychological costs might have um, for levels of trust. 
Um, so this is just one example. This was during the pandemic. This is actually a friend of mine. She's actually an academic at, um, at the University of Southern California. Um, but right, a lot of countries experienced this where there was a surge in interactions with the um, uh, public benefits infrastructure. And this was her niece um, who is a, a, was a waitress in Arizona and was trying to actually to a she's a single mother, toddler, um, and was trying to access documents to access the food stamp program or support for nutritional assistance in the U.S. And this was her experience. She's emailing her, her cousin saying, you know, I just spent an hour downloading documents um, and health insurance forms, um, and then I couldn't actually process it. It's just one little example, um, but there's all kinds of these examples. Um, we, there's another case that we talk about specifically with Medicaid, um, where um, uh, about 200,000 kids in, ten in the state of Tennessee lost health insurance coverage. And a lot of people found out that they lost health insurance coverage during the, these renewal processes because Tennessee had changed the forms without telling people. Um, anyway, you showing up at a doctor's office um, in one case that we talk about is a, a woman with a child who is recovering from cancer. She shows up at the doctor's office and they're like, uh, sorry, you don't have health insurance coverage anymore. So like right the level of fear, stress, anxiety that that can um, promote. Okay, so here's some key lessons from the existing research. So this is a body of research that has really taken off, I think, in the last 10 years or so. And I think there are things basically that, that, that we're starting to learn. So the first thing, the first most basic point here is that small burdens can have really large impacts. So this is a nice example of a study from this. So in the U.S., not only do we not have a single universal public health insurance program, we also pay a lot if you want to go to and get a college degree, basically. And we have this very complicated loan infrastructure um, because people have to pay so much of the costs of post-secondary schooling. Um, and this is just a figure from a paper that kind of examined um, one of the programs to help relieve those costs, which is a student loan forgiveness program. Um, and so these can be highly beneficial for people, right? You apply to this program and you can really massively cut the amount of payments you have to make on your student loans after the fact. And this experiment that they did basically was there's subpar en enrollment in these programs. So by some estimates, only about 30% of people eligible are receiving benefits. So the basic experiment here was to um, have the loan provider fill out the form for someone. Like, so they get on, you call up, the provider says, all right, I'm gonna fill out the form for you. They send the form to you. And um, all you'd have to do uh, was sign it and email it back. The control group, also just sort of on the phone, but they were directed to a website instead where they could download that form, fill it out and send it back. Um, the, the chart on the left here is the difference in percentage point terms of who actually applied, right? Huge difference. It rose from 24% to 60%. So simply the filling out the form for someone <laughs> um, had this huge impact basically. And it's right, a signal of how see, a seemingly small burden, just go to the website, fill out the form, in practice has really large impacts. And then the figure on the right there is just the difference in terms of the um, payment differences on a monthly basis, a difference between treatment and control of about $125 a month. There's also really large implications uh, for inequality in terms of these burdens. So I think this is the second thing that people are paying a lot more attention to. And there's sort of three major points here. The first point is, what we're seeing is the people who most need help are the least well placed to get it. So if you have a really complicated infrastructure that people have to navigate to access uh, a supplemental income program, um, the people who have the fewest resources are gonna really struggle to navigate that. So it might be language, it might be in the case of disability, people who are ill, or for example, those with cognitive or intellectual disabilities, um, or it could be as simple as just simply not having the time or money. People often pay people to help them navigate complicated systems, right? So there's a range of ways that plays out. We also know that people perform less well under conditions of scarcity, stress, poor health. So right, see that these are the same people who are gonna be needing to access these systems. We also know from existing cognitive and psychological research that under these conditions, people are already stressed and they already struggle um, to perform these kinds of activities. 
Um, and then generically speaking, at least in the US context, for sure, if you look at the different kinds of policies and programs that we all benefit from, whether I'm middle class or whether I am poor, the policies that I'm most likely to access are actually pretty easy to navigate. So the, my health insurance subsidies, for example, I, I have, it's subsidized by the government. I don't need to do a thing actually to get that. The employer does it for me, I don't even know. As a poor American, my subsidy is through the Medicaid program. As Don will talk about, incredibly complicated to navigate. And there's a range of different examples of this. But So these folks are off, often also just really, um, not only are they going to struggle more to, to navigate complicated programs, they're also actually more likely to need to navigate those government programs compared to um, middle income people to access subsidies. Um, and then finally here, and this is gonna be a good shift into the research, is I think the other thing that generically we've learned a lot about in terms of like what works best in terms of reducing burdens for people are the effects of automatic renewal. So if you're gonna think about a framework basically or a way to most effectively reduce burdens, the way to get there is to get as close as you can to sort of automated processes. So basically the idea here is you shift these burdens from individuals to the state. Every program has some kind of conditionality. The issue is who's bearing the costs, right? And I think we have systematically been learning um, that that's a big part of the uh, uh, puzzle here. Um, I think the other part of the, 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 thing, the, sorry, the things that we're learning in terms of um, automated renewals or generically um, the most effective kinds of interventions is, it's not that like things like nudges don't work, we know those work, but it's important to remember, for example, in terms of our framework, or this is one way to think about our framework, what we're learning basically is nudges tend to work where there are um, learning costs. If you're tossing in a lot of compliance and psychological costs, nudges probably aren't going to work as well. And I think we're starting to see that systematically um, in the literature. So these are the kinds of things basically that we're learning, I think, so far at least, um, to most effectively participate, increase participation in public programs, um, as well as kind of generically reduce burdens. I'm going to pass along to Don now. Thank you. Um so if you are a government or a researcher and you're trying to think about what do we do about administrative burdens, uh, we're going to offer some insights about one model for approaching this, which comes from the U.S., but might be a model for other countries. Uh, and here we're going to focus a little bit on what the Biden administration has done uh, relatively early on, they signed uh, one executive order on racial equity, and then later in December of 2021, they signed a more extensive uh, custom, uh, uh, customer experience executive order, uh, which ties reducing burdens in government to improving the quality of not just customer experience, but also people's trust in government. Um, and they've develop not just this executive order, but a series of distinct initiatives where they've provided guidance to agencies from the center of government saying, this is important. How do you think about administrative burdens? How should you measure it? And what sort of actions should you uh, undertake if you want to reduce burdens? Um, Part of what they've done is, I think, also introduce new tools and practices into government. So within the uh, customer experience executive order, there's mention, for example, of human-centered design and a statement that it's the policy of this government to now take on the tool of human-centered design and apply this to how we think about designing or reviewing existing processes in place. And, and that is something that is relatively new the language of human-centered design and thinking about how to systematically apply design practices to uh, the design or review of existing processes. They've also repurposed existing processes to make them more centered on administrative burden. So every year agencies have to prepare a budget Every year, they have to do mandatory performance reporting. Uh, the Biden administration has required that agencies uh, pay more attention to measuring and reporting on customer experience and burden reduction initiatives as part of those processes. Uh, 
there is an existing piece of legislation that exists called the Paperwork Reduction Act, uh, which is uh, primarily centered on measuring how much time people spend filling out forms. The Office of Management and Budget has reinterpreted that act and provided new guidance to agencies saying, you need to think about this Paperwork Reduction Act more extensively. So now you also need to think about the learning costs that are involved, uh, the compliance costs, not just filling out the form, but the documentation that people have to pull together, as well as the psychological costs. And so another strategy is really thinking about what are tools that exist that are in statutes that we can repurpose and use them to be more centered on administrative burden. Um, so we'll finish our talk today by giving some examples of ways to reduce burdens in practice. And this is uh, I'm drawing from uh, work coordinated with uh, uh, lots of scholars here, Sebastian Yilka, Eric Gianella, Alison Morgan, Nate Olin, and Xiang Xu. Um, and here we are returning to the topic of Medicaid. As Pam mentioned before, you should think about Medicaid as basically public health insurance uh, for people with lower incomes, primarily uh, where you have to show every year that you're eligible for this program. So it has this high administrative barrier to participate. Um, one thing that happened at the end of the pandemic is the Biden administration pushed state governments, and as Pam mentioned, state governments are the ones who actually administer the program. So there's lots of variation across the country about the quality of administration to expand automatic renewal. In, in Medicaid terms, this is known as ex parte, but there's already a law on the books that says, if you as a state government have the data that tells you that this person continues to be eligible, just renew them. You don't have to make them go through the process. Um, but there was wide variation in the degree to which states were actually doing this. And especially at the end of the pandemic, there was concern about lots of people losing public health insurance. And so the Biden administration sent out a letter to state agencies saying, you have to take this seriously. We will help you do this. We will give you all sorts of waivers and flexibilities to expand ex parte renewal. And they've had some success with this. Um, and so over the 2023 to 2024, um, you see a, an, a significant increase at the national level when it comes to ex parte renewals. So overall, you've gone from, on average, about one in four people going through the Medicaid renewal process um, being renewed automatically. They don't have to fill out the paperwork to almost one in two at this point. And that's an enormous difference then when you think about the millions of people who no longer have to fill out the paperwork, who don't lose that time, don't have to experience those burdens, and then are also not at risk of losing coverage. So how have they made that progress? Uh, we'll give two examples here, one within a specific state and one at the national level. Um, so we are working uh, with the state of Minnesota uh, on a project that examines how they try to expand ex parte or automatic renewal for one specific population, which is the aged, blind, and disabled population, a very vulnerable population, also um, consistent with what we noted earlier because of issues of health and disability, a population that's more likely to struggle with paperwork uh, processes. Um, here we're working with Code for America, which is a nonprofit civic tech firm. Um, so they have great technological skills, uh, but they're outside of government, but they are working with government to try and improve processes. And basically their tech skill are being put to use here, in this case, in helping the states to organize its administrative data, to find different sources of data across government, to connect those, and to give that data in a very easy to digest, to digest way to case workers who are making the actual decisions about who gets to be automatically re-enrolled. Um, and what we see, and this is sort of a pre-post analysis, we're currently finishing um, a, a more detailed analysis of this, but the pre-post sort of gets at the, the, the point here. 
So before this automatic renewal for this population was um, uh, expanded with the help of Code for America, about 40% of this population um, is getting their coverage. Um, after automatic renewal, so this is, we're going from July to then uh, we're taking an average of the next three months, that goes to just about 80%. So you see this enormous difference in terms of actual uh, Medicaid renewal because of the introduction of this change. So that's a big effect. We were also interested in heterogeneous effects or the, the ways in which automatic renewal interacts with inequality. One thing we knew going into this study is that uh, families who were um, um, non-white families, especially black families, tended to have lower than average enrollment in uh, Medicaid. And we can observe then that the effects of the automatic renewal seems to increase their enrollment so that it, it's about average with other families. And so one way to think about this is um, automatic renewal levels the playing field in a way that helps to reduce inequalities. If there's fewer hurdles, there's fewer opportunities for families with more disadvantages to, to um, get caught up with those hurdles. At the national setting, we're also interested in an experiment that took place uh, where the US Digital Service, and again, you might think about this as like a civic, civic tech type of organization, but now working inside of government. This was an organization that was created 10 years ago in 2014. Um, they're digital experts who are trying to improve government processes. Uh, they, in addition to uh, um, sending messages from the Biden administration telling states to improve their, their practices, they also, in some states, sent these USDS experts to the states for about a one-week period of time where they would meet every day with their state counterparts and look for ways to improve services. Um, and in particular, uh, talking with the, the, the USDS uh, team that, that visited these states, they brought um, two types of capacity. One is sort of technical capacity. So identifying different types of data sources that could verify people's eligibility, also looking at the actual code that states were running to verify that it didn't have errors, it was consistent with current policy. They also brought policy capacity to the table. Um, so in some cases, telling states, you have more flexibility than you realize. Here's what the actual national policy says. Um, here's a, here are ways you can maximize um, your opportunities here. And so we wanted to see that, that this effort, this sort of tiger team approach where the national government is sending folks to the state government to help them make a difference. Um, and so we're tracking that. Um, and if you look at the, the, the sort of um, blue line in the middle, that's what happens to these four states that have the intervention. We've also simulated where we think they would have been um, without that simulation, and that's the sort of dotted red line. So overall, ex parte renewal rates or automatic renewal rates are increasing, but the effects of the USDS intervention is essentially to take these four lower performing states and bring them up to the national average, even as that national average is increasing. Um, one caveat that we want to add is that Automation can mean many different things. Um, you can also think about the use of algorithms to automate um, review of potential fraud, for example. And there have been cases, we won't go into them in tremendous detail, but in Australia and the Netherlands, where um, automation of checks on welfare fraud or childcare benefits has gone wrong. Um, and in the Dutch case, at least, caused the downfall of a government where the, the cabinet and the prime minister resigned and new elections were, were called. Um, and so I think we're very much looking for ways to think about how technology can improve services, um, but you also want to be aware of the ways in which um, um, algorithms can introduce bias and failure. In these two cases, we see some common patterns. There was a very disproportionate focus on minimizing fraud rather than maintaining access to benefits. 
the algorithms themselves had many false positives and there weren't enough, I think, human beings that were checking uh, the, the ways in which the algorithms were having these negative effects. And from the perspective of the clients who were interacting with these checks on whether they, they should have had uh, these resources or not, it became the secondary venue where burdens took place, that where they had to prove that they had you know, um, pay stubs from three years back, or they had to prove that they hadn't engaged in some sort of fraud. And so the, sh the state shifted much more burdens back on the clients in these sort of um, fraud detection processes. Um, so concluding with some lessons here, um, uh, back in the December of 2023, Pam and I and Amy Whitman published a report that was commissioned by the federal government to draw out some early lessons about how well burden reduction was happening in the US government. And with some key points, um, part of the challenge here is building a culture that centers on the public. What is the public's experience of these administrative processes? Um, how do you center um, um, their experience um, using tools like human-centered design or journey mapping. Second, uh, this requires not just a change in culture, but also a change in practice, which in turn requires capacity to do this well. And so the, the agencies who tended to be more successful in advancing burden reduction tended to have dedicated customer experience staff whose primary job was to review um, existing processes uh, take into account the experience of the public and then revise those processes based on those experiences. Um, collaboration, because in many cases, redesigning processes requires having multiple agencies working together. In some cases, this is about data sharing. So agency A might have the data that will allow agency B to simplify its processes by verifying eligibility. Um, simplifying processes. I think governments are generally very good at building new um, systems in place and adding rules and relatively bad about reviewing whether those systems and processes are actually um, um, being effective or not. And so having processes in place is great, but you have to be willing to go back every so often to see if they're still um, fit for purpose. Um, and then the final point consistent with uh, what we've just talked about, technology is a great enabler here, especially technology that can leverage administrative data to shift burdens away from the public and onto the state. Um, but blind fate technology can lead to blind spots in ways that actually put more burdens on the public and lead to worse outcomes. Uh, we will finish there and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That that was really fantastic, and having you both here was really made a difference. We really appreciated uh, having more of a, the overview of the framework at the beginning, and then also a lot of uh, case studies uh, at the end. So really, thank you so much for a great presentation. Um, I have many questions, <laughs> um, so I will kick it off. But please feel free to also think about your own questions. And I think uh, Don and Pam will be very happy to to develop more about the case studies that you briefly presented as well. Um, one of the first thing that uh, it's like <laughs> it's keeping me awake at night from time to time is. You know, we, we, we have all these great executive orders and we also have a recommendation now from the OECD, uh, which we'll go through very soon on human center um, and citizen center uh, services. Uh, this is great, uh, great push. And we all know that you, using human center design and journey mapping can be useful. But at the end of the day, there's something that, um, is, is still up there, which is how do we measure actually uh, all these things? And so we know that with what you call compliance cost with time and money and other things, we are uh, doing a good job. It has been uh, decades we have been measuring administrative burden. But what about the rest? Imagine you are a government uh, and you really want to make sure that 
service delivery and design is done properly, trying not to increase inequality, et cetera. What are our best tools uh, now on measuring learn, what you call learning costs and psychological costs? So that's a really great question. Um, and we have been working to some extent ourselves, certainly on developing um, ways of measuring those things. So um, I think so one of the one of the key challenges actually, and I think this even applies to existing measures to some extent at least, is that we it's hard to measure things in terms of understanding burdens or experiencing for people who never enter the processes in the first place, right? So take up rates are, are helpful in that way. Um, but for example, learning costs in terms of, right, it's, it's actually very difficult. <laughs> and I, you know, we don't have, I think, clear answers at this point, unfortunately, beyond take up rates in terms of how do you figure out um, uh, whether or not you have high barriers to entry, be it learning or compliance costs actually for that matter. Um, now that said, there are ways to employ, I think a mixture, honestly, some qualitative methods, focus groups in terms of doing, reaching out to community organ. So I'm thinking in a US context, but I think this could apply in other places, right? Reaching out to the organizations that actually interact with the people who would be eligible for services um, and both in terms of interacting with those groups and gaining some knowledge about that, um, I think, honestly, I think initially largely with kind of qualitative methods. Um, and then in turn, being able to access and actually talk to individuals um, to get a better sense of that. On the psychological costs, there actually are, we have a measure that we've, um, like a very short measure that we've generated to use to kind of evaluate that. And really on some basic level, um, you know, there's a lot of, of different, like psychologists have a range of different measures that you could employ to try to just um, either in surveys or I guess in qualitative interviews as well to kind of get at those experiences. Um, as well. So those are some sort of, I think, initial kinds of thoughts, um, but I'm sure Don has. Um, yeah. Uh, so if you think about the world of, as two populations, one is the population who never, never enters the funnel of applying for a program or engaging with the program, then there's a lot you don't know about that population, right? And, and so there, I think the challenges are harder. There are some examples where um, using sophisticated randomized controlled trials can help you understand what is the type of barrier that they're encountering. So for example, um, with the earned income tax credit, which is uh, a benefit in the US, there have been a bunch of trials that have tried to get at whether stigma reduces participation. And basically at this point, we know the answer is no. It's not psychological cost that's reducing participation. There's another, um, there's like a, a student um, support called FAFSA where we've done a bunch of empirical trials and we know it's not learning cost or preventing people from getting access to this because we've in, embedded in those trials, we've given people information and they don't respond to the information but then when we help people through the process, they respond to that. And so we know it's really it's the compliance costs that are driving things. And so that's a way in which the types of costs that that typology can help guide some of the experimental designs that can help you understand where's the bottleneck in this process. Then for that second population of people who enter the funnel, uh, I think governments should just be do, employing user surveys at every step of the process. Um, and they can be simple one or two question surveys that you get with a, with a text once you've completed the process or a pop-up survey. Um, Pam mentioned we, we designed um, a simple survey, which is, it's, out, it's open access. It's in the Journal of Behavioral Public Administration. Um, 
And using that, you can start to observe patterns of how people respond to different types of interventions. So for example, using that, one thing we discovered in a project in California is that uncertainty creates a large administrative burden. Um, um, we can track people who applied for a benefit and not surprisingly, when you ask people about burdens and they didn't get the benefit, they tend to be very negative. They tend to remember the experience more negatively, which is maybe you think of that as like a cognitive bias, but you know, if, bad, if you have bad experiences, you tend to rate the experience negatively. People who got the benefit tend to rate the process a little bit higher, um, but people who didn't find out the answer tended to respond in a way that's very similar to the people who didn't get the benefit. And so leaving people waiting for a long period of time where they don't know where they are, we know now that that creates the sense of uh, administrative burden. If I could just quickly two follow up points. So on the, and this is, I think actually, especially in the European context compared to the US context, at least, um, you know, that basic point about you have administrative data, you can, you can generate a sample frame of people who are, should be accessing programs that they're not. Um, and then you have all kinds of tools after that to figure out why. I think the second point, the, the thing that always keep in mind in terms of the surveying people it, and the it's so critical, I just want to emphasize to keep those things short, because you don't want to generate burdens to figure out, <laughs> to reduce burdens, right? Um, and people just won't answer them either. So super, super short, it's critical. Thank you for a, a, a very comprehensive answer. And I think we could talk about this for, for a long time, but uh, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, some of the points that you, that you raised about, for example, the importance of uncertainty and how this could actually uh, increase a lot of all the learning compliance and psychological cost. Um, so I'm very keen to, to continue the conversation with, with you and with our academics from the world. At the OECD, we really will put a lot of um, accent on trying to, to get out the best possible um, practices so that governments can actually have something ready to go that you can start experiment with. Um, so I know that we have a few questions also from online. So I can't see the people uh, on the screen, unfortunately, but I know that Margot, who's a colleague uh, of us uh, at the OECD, has a question. So Margot, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you very much. And thank you for the presentation. It's a um, very interesting topic, I think, on, on which we can all uh, relate. Um, I would have three questions. Um, so you mentioned the loss of trust as a result of uh, psychological co costs, which I found extremely um, interesting. So have you been able to measure the impacts of this friction on trust in governments? For instance, does it affect trust for governments at all levels, the, the state, uh, central government, or is it more targeted to the institutions we dealt with? Um, my second question would be, do you have also uh, geographical indicators of friction? Uh, does it affect more peripheral and rural areas, for instance? And my, la my last question uh, would be about digitalization. Um, so technology may help reducing administrative burdens, as you as you've shown, but it can also increase inequality due to inequal access to digital um, and decrease the proximity of uh, citizens with their governments. So I would be interested to hear about your view on the on the use of digital uh, to actually reduce frictions. Thank you very much. Uh, great questions. Um, on trust, one thing we didn't talk about in the presentation, but going back to that Minnesota example, we surveyed the people who went through the automatic enrollment and people who went through the paperwork enrollment several months later, and we asked them about their experience and their trust in government. And what we found is people who went through the automatic enrollment reported lower experience of burden, which is good. That makes us feel confident that the survey responses are valid. And they also reported higher support for the program and higher trust in government. Um, 
trust in government is sort of a unicorn that every <laughs> government cares intensely about. And so an important caveat here is that we don't think that one specific experience is going to transform the way in which you think about government. But it's plausible that an accumulation of good experiences does matter, or an accumulation of very bad experiences does matter. And if you're thinking about this from a measurement perspective, you should probably think about measuring trust in a causal context that's logical for the user. So if you're asking them about their experience with Medicaid, you should ask about the state healthcare office or the county administrator that provides it, as opposed to the national government. Um, so we have some maybe promising um, evidence about trust there, but I, I don't want to go into a room and tell politicians, here's how you solve the trust problem. Um, but I do think historically there hasn't been enough attention by policymakers to human experience of government when they have thought about that trust problem. Just, I mean, the executive or the, the Biden executive order is explicit, like explicitly states its goal is to improve trust, actually. But like we don't actually have a ton of evidence. Um, and I just want to back up Don's point there. I think, you know, that it's it's really the accumulation that matters. And we also I think one really interesting avenue that that we should look a little bit more closely at are these the linkage to specific kinds of psychological costs. So in the U.S. context, there's a lot of fear in undocumented or not even undocumented, just generically immigrant communities, even people who are legal residents, um, that's really affecting, and we have tons of evidence, um, their access to government benefits and services. They're just too afraid. Um, anyway, so that's a really important avenue. I'll just quickly go through the other two questions. Um, the kinds of burdens that people face vary across geographic context. So I think in rural contexts, um, the kinds of barriers, right, that people are going to face are going to be if you need people to like go somewhere to access a benefit or service, right? Um, especially for low income populations, it's not just that you're in a rural community and there's not going to be public transport in the same ways, or at least certainly in the U.S. context, you're probably actually going to act, act may not even have a reliable car. So it's like it, it's really thinking through on um, the specific contexts that people are in the specific infrastructure that's there that's going to impact their ability to kind of access these benefits and services. And so certainly in, in urban context, though, there's like different kinds of access issues that people might face um, that may be more about um, just poor pu public infrastructure, for example. So it just it really depends. And so I, I don't want to universally say, right, because it, but it is critical to think about that context, basically, um, when you're designing about designing or evaluating these kinds of burdens in public programs. The digital question is really good. And I want to emphasize something here, a couple of things. So the first is, it is still the case that older adults, if you're going to think about particular populations, um, older adults, and I think this is fairly universal across context, do still tend to struggle with digital interfaces. They're just less likely. They don't quite have the same skill sets that younger people do. Now, that's going to change like across cohorts, at least probably going to start changing. Um, but for example, in the U.S., only about... I think the last time I looked is about 60% of older adults are regularly using internet or like regularly using computers, for example. So you really do have to think carefully about that. And I also think the thing generically to think about these sort of tech-based interventions, um, and Don sort of alluded to this when he was talking at the end, right? But they, it's sort of like the Google's original thing, like you can use this for good or evil, <laughs> right? And if you want to use digital interfaces and digital technologies and automated processes to reduce burdens, you absolutely can. And we have a lot of good evidence about that. But if your goal is to make those services more difficult or to target certain populations, which I think some of the examples that Don provided, in some cases, that would 
they were targeting specific populations, you can do that too. So we can use it to increase burdens or we can use it to decrease burdens. I think we don't want to go down a road where we think it's just some special thing. It's not really, it's like anything, anything else. Uh, Sorry. Very, very quick addendum <laughs> to that point. Um, if, you, if you're a government that's trying to think about the use of digital and you recognize the potential for inequality, one way to think about a principle here is that you want to build a, an easy road that 80 or 90% of the population can get through with minimal frictions and then reallocate resources to help the remaining people who are taking a harder road because of their difficulties in managing the process or because they have some sort of unusual life situation. Thank you. And thank you, Margot, for uh, really great questions here. And thank you for your answer. Um, let's take another question from online. I know Eva is joining us from Australia. So Eva, over to you as you have your digital hands up. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you so much, um, Pam and Don. What a fabulous presentation and love all the insights and case studies. Thank you so much for that. Um, I noticed on the last slide um, you had some really great takeaways, um, including one around you know, the value of having a, a dedicated customer experience team to address admin burden. And I wanted to see just from your perspective and um, from your experience seeing admin burden reduction done well, um, what role do you see for behavioural science in reducing admin burden? And um, what are some of the, I guess, the skills that you think might be valuable in that? Uh, so nice to see you again. Thanks for staying. I was Google, uh, Googling what time is it in Sydney. Uh, <laughs> and so thanks for staying up to watch this. Uh, so I think behavioral science can bring a lot of skills to the table in this discussion. And I think the discussion also challenges behavioral science to think more broadly about what it does. So one of the obvious skills um, that, that we sort of bring to the table with our lab is we can do um, A-B testing or, or randomized control trials, where if a government is willing to pilot something, we can say, we'll tell you if that worked or, or if it didn't. And sometimes they, they won't do that, but they might do a pre-post test. And we can find a clever way to make you know reasonably plausible estimate of whether that worked or not. So we have that skill. Um, the second skill is actually going to the trouble of writing up the results. Um, and governments do not do this because they've moved on to the next project. So having a team that can like just sit with the data and write up the results and maybe even put it through peer review to establish the credibility, I think that is, those are two sort of important skills. There are other things like being able to familiarize people with human-centered design or, or journey mapping. And there, I think actually there's a lot where behavioral science can marry more with design thinking to modernize the way in which it approaches government problems. And just quickly, I mean, I think one really important contribution is reminding folks who are doing this on the ground, and we're starting to see this more, is like the evaluation is actually really important, that it might seem intuitive that if I just do this thing, it'll reduce burdens and improve outcomes. It's not, it, it isn't actually always true. So I'll just go back to an example of the, um, the earned income tax credit experiment that Don mentioned in the US, um, which is that they did find um, interventions increased take up, but the stigma experiment actually increased stigma. <laughs> So the, the experiment that they did to reduce stigma actually seemed to increase it. Um, so anyway, one thing that we think, I, I think that we've found in, more, in partnering with state governments and partnering with Code for America is that sometimes like these organizations get really excited about this stuff um, and want to implement, 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 and maybe are a little bit less enthusiastic or struggle to devote the proper resources to do the evaluations. And so I think that's another really important message that behavioral scientists can just keep reminding people. <laughs> it, it may not be as successful as you think it is. If you're not, you need to make sure. Fantastic, thank you. Um, great. Uh, I know we have uh, many other questions. Uh, we might have time for another one. I know that Avishai has his uh, hands up as well. 
Avishai, over to you if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Avishai Benish from the Hebrew University. Uh, it's a great event and uh, I'm, I'm dealing with take up for many years now and also with administrative burden. And we are just now establishing an administrative burden reduction lab at the Hebrew University. So when I saw this uh, event, I was uh, eager uh, to join and uh, for good reasons, I see. It was fascinating. Uh, Pamela and Don, thank you for your leadership on bringing back this issue so strongly into uh, the academic and even policy arena. Uh, I feel that I a little bit uh, know you through your writing, not personally yet. So thank you very much for, uh, for this. Uh, I was engaged in last years in this issue through trying to offer a typology for burden reduction with uh, colleagues like Noam Torshiz, who is also here, and others. And also I'm doing some research on healthcare in Israel with uh, Professor Sharon Gilad, my colleague from the Hebrew And I have uh, three uh, short points, one, uh, two for you, and one maybe to the OECD, which I understand is our uh, facilitator here. So the two uh, short questions are, uh, first, uh, Pamela, you talked about the psychological costs. And I think there are areas there uh, which we still have a considerable gap. And I was wondering, how do you see the, uh, the, the way forward for understanding better the psychological uh, barriers, especially from a, also from a perspective of how to reduce them? Uh, my, my second question is uh, about uh, automatization, which is uh, clearly, and I totally agree, the gold standard of the effort or the policy effort to reduce burden is to avoid them in the first place. Uh, and it's it's complicated. It can be, uh, the digitalization can be used both for a, a, a increasing access and reducing access. But another point which we faced here in Israel is about privacy, uh, which is also, uh, so how do you think about that? Uh, uh, how we should th think about that in balancing between the advantages, let's say, for increasing take up and privacy issue, how you, what is your conceptualization or thinking about that? And the last thing is for uh, the venue, the OECD. I think that it's also a challenge for the OECD. I see a lot of writing about reducing administrative and also initiatives of the OECD using this terminology of administrative burdens, mainly for businesses. And I was wondering whether the OECD is also uh, willing to take this challenge and a conceptualization of administrative burdens also in terms of citizens and making access for services, benefits, and other rights, not only in terms of the welfare state, more accessible. So this is my... I'll go fast here, because I know we don't have a lot of time. So I'll be super quick about a couple of things. So we just need a lot more research on psychological costs. It's clearly the area where we're still weakest. Um, and I do think the initial entry into understanding those is one, it's not just stigma, <laughs> a lot of other things, um, and really talking to people. I think just empirically, the, the place to start is with qualitative interviews with people. Um, and there's some good work around that. On the privacy point, I, what, this comes up a lot in the U.S. context. And the thing that I want to emphasize here is we have like, anytime we implement something, we have multiple goals and multiple values. Privacy is one value. Another value or goal is access. Um, and at least in the U.S. context, I can definitively say that the government agencies tend to overvalue privacy relative to access. And I'll just give a trite example, but I think it kind of sums up, I do believe, kind of where we are in that point, which is like if you actually talk to people um, on the ground and they do not understand why, for example, like why government doesn't automate more. Because they'll say things like, you already have my data. Why aren't you using it? Why do I have to keep telling you the same thing over and over again? You already know this about me. Um, and certainly in the US uh, sector, um, people, I think behaviorally, if they, the way that we interact, for example, with um, private entities, we willingly give away our privacy all the time to make things easier. I think behaviorally, behaviorally, we also see like people probably act, 
value the access more than they do privacy. Not that privacy is not relevant, but I think we're thinking about it at this point in a very skewed way um, based on what people actually want and how they actually behave. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so first, uh, it's, it's, we've really uh, loved seeing the, the research coming out of Israel. And one of the thing that's, things that's been so exciting is seeing parts of the world who've taken this idea and developed incredible research um, that we would not have thought about. And so thank you for your work. Um, again, if you're thinking about governing principles, one way in which we've talked about privacy with policymakers in the U.S. is that thinking about applying a do no harm policy so that sharing people's data in ways that can benefit them, I think intuitively makes a lot of sense as opposed to sharing people's data in ways that you know are used to punish them um, makes it a much more complicated conversation. Thank you so much. I might uh, just answer very quickly to the point directly to the OECD very quickly. Yes, uh, you're right. Traditionally, the work has been focusing on administrative burden for businesses in regulatory administrative burden. The second point is yes, we are, the OECD is working much more on citizens now, uh, not only on businesses. And the good news is that we are ramping up that uh, work, but also we recently published a new report uh, in June called Fixing Frictions, Sludge Audits Around the World in collaboration with the New South Wales government in Australia with EVA. Um, and so this is very much focusing on uh, burden on citizens, uh, so not on businesses per se. And this is just beginning, I think. So definitely very welcome your, your, your comment. Great, these are great news. <laughs> Um, and on this point, I think it's a, it's a great way to uh, wrap up this fantastic event. Really, we feel very, very lucky that Pam and Don came to, to Paris and visit us at USD. And thank you so much for all the many participants on, online. Thank you so much for your, your engagement as usual. And I will see you soon at the next event organized by USD.